Welcome back to another episode of the Better Than I Found It podcast. Joining me today is Travis Wolf of College Golf Fellowship. Travis and I go way back to his, uh, literally before his college days. He played golf at TCU, but he was also a golf camper at Oklahoma State when I was an assistant coach and then the head coach afterward. So I've known Travis for over 20 years, but he and I not only reminisce about those days, but we talk about and discuss his role with the ministry and also the many facets of CGF that make it unique in the world of college golf. I think you'll enjoy this podcast. Enjoy the listening. My guest today is former TCU golfer and current College Golf Fellowship staff member, Travis Wool from Fort Worth, Texas. Travis, welcome today. Thanks for having me, Coach. Yeah, you bet. Well, you are actually doing your job today. You're in Waco, Texas. Uh, you uh, had a Bible study with my golf team, so um, I thought it'd be a good time to get just a nice podcast together here, a little interview with you, and just kind of let my listeners know a little bit more about what College Golf Fellowship is. So if you could dive right in and just kind of tell them what, what is College Golf Fellowship. Yeah. Um, I mean, for, first off, just so it's on the record books, a couple weeks ago, TCU did beat Baylor in an upset in football. Yeah, they, they did. I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, it's it truly does take the work of God in – a TCU Horn Frogs life for one to come down to Waco, Texas and say sick them. But, you know, I, I love it and it's great. And I love getting to be a part of your team and around. But uh, so College Golf Fellowship is a ministry, Christian ministry uh, that has been around since 1980. And so basically what we are, are chaplains uh, for men's college golf teams around the country. And so we have 25 guys all over Um that are a part of men's college golf teams really through coaches inviting us to be a part uh, to where we come and and we just walk with guys uh, throughout their four years in college to be able to share with them the good news of Jesus, uh, care for them well, Uh, even guys that really have no interest in um, in faith or religious things, we're there to to be a help um, and to be a, a mentor, a counselor, uh, and someone to help guide these guys through that time. You know, it might be uh, pointed out right now as you're on college campuses like Baylor, which is a faith-based institution, and you're at, on college campuses that are not faith-based. So, you know, if the coach invites you in, you can uh, you can have the opportunity to minister and to uh, walk alongside guys. Yeah, absolutely. It is, uh, it's something that truly impacted me in my life playing golf at TCU. Uh, we have a guy named Brad Payne, who's our president now. Uh, I guess he was back then too, but uh, I play golf from 2006 to 2010 at TCU and he would regularly come down each week and do our Bible studies. And it was truly uh, an impact on me and my faith is where I came to know Jesus in college, uh, which was pretty cool. And I know we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, College Golf Fellowship it is an amazing ministry. Um, like I said, it started in 1980. It was, was kind of cool how it started. There were guys um, from Search Ministries, guys named Larry Moody and Dave Kruger, that would go out on the PGA Tour and minister to guys out there. And they just had a heart to want to pour into college golfers. Uh, as everyone know, really listening to this podcast, College golfers are interesting. We're we're different. We're a different breed. Absolutely. And especially in, in college golf, you you go uh, to school on campus, and then more likely than not, you go out to the golf course and you're there till the evening. And so, a lot of great ministries do great work, um, but there are some guys in the PGA Tour that really felt like some of the golfers are kind of getting left out of some of those things. And so had a heart to start College Golf Fellowship in 1980 and has really grown to where it is now. Our first staff guy is a guy named Rick Massengill that played in the PGA Tour uh, for several years, one on tour um, out there, and uh, his life was impacted by the PGA Tour Players Bible Study. Uh, He came to know Jesus and and had a, a call to go into ministry and um, he hired Brad Payne, who's now our president, and, and several other guys that are with us still now. Um, 
and uh, you know Brad he spoke at a an FCA something or other FCA when I was in high school and they had a pamphlet with his story in it and I've kept that in my bible ever since Rick Massingale Rick, Rick Massingale really? has been in there ever since yeah, yeah. his story of him and his wife and how she said, you don't love me, you just love golf. And that hit him pretty hard right there. But, yeah, uh, yeah Rick's a great guy. He is. And he's he's still been involved in our ministry, those not on our staff. And we have a, a two-man college tournament that we do basically every year in Dallas called the Rick Massengill Four Ball that's really fun. Uh, and that is uh, men's college golfers can bring a uh, – a teammate uh, and come partner up and play in a four ball. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. We do that. We've had some guys at Baylor playing that uh, every, every year we have at least one or two, but you know, you mentioned 25 staff members today. I I'm old enough to remember when I first got involved with it, it only had two basically. And that was uh, Stephen Bunn, who at the time was in North Carolina, but is now in Birmingham, Alabama and Brad Payne, just two. Mm. And those two guys, came and found me at the Palmetto Dunes Collegiate out in South Carolina when I was an assistant coach at Oklahoma State. Mm. They came and found me and said, hey, coach, we've heard all about you. Love to invite you to a Bible study tonight we're having over here at this condominium, you know, near the golf course. And that was the first I'd heard anything about it. And before long, Brad and, well, Brad, because he was in Dallas, was on campus in Stillwater and, you know, and and ministering to our guys and, uh, and it was interesting because we had non-Christians and Christians alike on the team and guys would show up and have dinner with Brad and they'd do Bible study and it was it was a great but it was a very small ministry at the time. Mm-hmm. It has grown. Yeah, it has. It was amazing when I started at TCU in two thousand six, I think we had four, maybe five staff guys. Uh and now we've grown to to twenty five, which is pretty amazing. Um there are I think roughly twelve hundred men's college golf teams around the country, which is insane. When mm-hmm. I when I heard that number, I was like, "Man, really?" Uh, but across from JUCO all the way, uh, NAIA, D three, D two, D one schools, um, and really our board just kind of had a vision of saying, "Hey, we just want to be able to reach uh, every single one of these men's college golf team teams with uh, with who Jesus is and be able to care for and impact them." And so it's it's been really fun to see how. Uh, College Golf Fellowship's grown over the last several years. It's been amazing. It's been fun watching. I've been uh, an advisory board member along with Jay Sewell at Alabama. We've been on the board for uh, a long time, just kind of lending, you know, our help if we can. But mainly we're pretty busy, so we don't have time to attend everything that you do. But, you know, it's funny. You and I uh, have a, a relationship that goes back before you were involved with College Golf Fellowship. It goes quite a ways back there to the Oklahoma State Golf Camp. It does. It was, uh, I think it was my seventh grade year. So it was around year 2000. So 20 years ago plus uh, that I remember we met. And the camp to go to, at least when I was growing up and and uh, thinking about that, was Oklahoma State Golf Camp. And so, you know, a little kid from uh, Fort Worth going up to Stillwater to uh, go to golf camp and hopefully get recognized by you know, whether it's Oklahoma State or, or whoever else there. And it's actually where I met Coach Montegill, too. Uh, and I remember he would drive uh, our bus every single time, and uh, he was great. He, he would always tell stories. He was so funny. But um, as he would know, and he, I would say this if he was sitting here, too, we were always the last people to get to the golf course. And uh, Coach Montegill was like, you know what? I'm never in a hurry. I don't want to get in a wreck. <laughs> and so I was like, well, you know, we got there safe. The goal was achieved. Uh, and so I, I got to know Coach Montegill really well there, too, uh, along with you. But I was definitely there to try to impress somebody uh, in order to somehow weasel my way onto a college golf team at some point. When you were first coming to camp, you were I was the assistant coach. And by the time you came your last time to camp, I'd become the head coach. And, you know, it's funny. I look back on it. I recall, this is my memory. I recall, and I have a great memory, by the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of waning. You're getting old. Yeah, so. well, okay. But <laughs> I do re- recall a young boy from Fort Worth who wore slacks every day to golf camp, and I thought, man, this kid's trying to make an impression. You don't remember it that way? I don't. But it's how I remember it. Gosh, don't be that kid. You, you, were, dre- you were dressed to the tees. You look great in, in your slacks there at golf camp. But anyway, you did come to camp three years in a row. It was uh, interesting to get to meet you. And then, obviously, we rekindled that relationship when you were in college at TCU. I was at Oklahoma State, so we saw each other at tournaments all the time. You guys had a really good golf team at TCU, and 
and uh, so we saw you at nationals as well. Yeah, it was it was fun. I, I was I always had this kind of dream of going to play golf at Oklahoma State, and um, you know, coach just said, "Hey, you're just you just not quite good enough," which was okay. You know, I, I looked back at my life and 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 saw that uh, man going to TCU was a great privilege and an opportunity, and and we were good. Uh, y'all were really good at that time, which was crazy. I mean, that was Ricky Fowler. And Kevin, Kevin Tway. Tway and Peter Uline and Morgan Hoffman and Trent Leon and you had Jonathan Moore in the mix there, Ryan Posey. Uh, I mean, guys that were really – oh, and um, Spanish guy. Yeah, Pablo Martin. Pablo. Yeah. Um, incredible. I mean, he just won – I remember one of the crazy stories. So, and Coach Monaghel and I will talk about this all the time. We had uh, regionals my freshman year uh, at Rich Harvest Farms. Mm-hmm. And so that would have been spring of 2007. Seven. And that place was so hard. Recent, uh, more recently, they had softened it a bunch, but it was the rough was six, seven, eight inches long. The greens were purple. It was, you know, April or early May in in Chicago. So it was mm. still cold. It was windy. Mm. Um, and Mr. Rich wanted to make that place as hard as possible. And man, he did. He succeeded that week, did he, he not? He did. I, I remember I shot 88 the first round. Okay. With my first experience okay. in postseason yeah. of, uh, of college golf. And that was uh, humbling to say mm. the least. Uh, but I remember Pablo Martin just got done winning a European tour event, maybe a month or two Spring before break. that. Yeah, it was a month before. And and then he went out and shot, what, 82 one of the rounds out there? He shot 84, and I saw 84. every shot. <laughs> wow. Holy smokes. But it, it was funny because there's a guy named Dan Waltman. I can't remember the other guy, but I think him and another guy shot one under that mm-hmm. first round. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Rich was like, don't water the greens. Yep. He didn't want anybody to, to shoot under par out there. And uh, – um, it was it was pretty crazy. I played with Jonathan Vegas the first two days, and it was a stripe show. There was a par th- – Jonathan was a great player. There was a par three. I don't know if they, we played it as the front nine or the back nine that year. I'm not really sure, but it was like 16 or 7. Mm-hmm. And it was a five-iron par three, and it just looked like they just pushed up this earth and had this – Green, you couldn't have hold, held with a sand wedge. No yeah. chance. It was number. It was number seven. seven I remember okay. it. And, yeah, it was uh, seven. I think I hit a seven iron, and it's just one hop and over the green. Over I the mean, green. just n- no chance. If you did hit the green, you putted it off the green into a hazard. Mm-hmm. And we were playing it in the morning, the final round of that regional, and so it was our seventh hole, and it was purple and crusty already. And I, the wind was blowing thirty. I thought. This afternoon, they're not going to be able to finish this hole. and But it's interestingly enough, 10 years later when they played the national championship there, it was way better. They had made so many great changes, and that golf course was very playable. But I do recall that your freshman year, that was a rough, rough go at regionals. Yeah, it's funny. And even in the times that we've talked, um, you being crazy as you are and recording every single score that every single person shot from every tournament round, and I guarantee you, if you look back in your books, you'll be able to find find that score. Well, that 88's uh, in there, I'm sure. Oh, it is. I'll, probably, I'll go highlight it this evening. It's you great. should. You, you should. should remember it. But, you know, you, you uh, we, so we've talked kind of about a little bit of the history of College Golf Fellowship and how it's grown and the impact it's had. But, I mean, the impact you've just had on our team today at Baylor because you came down, you had lunch with them, you had a Bible study with them, and then normally, if you weren't doing this podcast interview right now, you'd be out watching them practice or whatever. It's their day off uh, today, and I give them a day off so that you can spend the time with them, and it's it's their choice to do it. And so there's guys among those 24 staff members that are all around on campuses all across this country right now, mm-hmm. talking to kids and ministering to them and walking along with them. So... You, you do that on a weekly basis. Mm-hmm. But there's something else you do at college golf tournaments, uh, the 25 of you. You pick out college golf tournaments. To tell, them, tell us about that. Yeah, so our staff guys, it's kind of really three things of what we do. We, we will go uh, with the coaches – uh, permission to come invite us to be a part of their team, to do Bible studies with their teams, to disciple guys, just kind of share with them man, who Jesus is um, and the hope that we have in him. And so just coming alongside guys in their time in college, uh, whether it's 
you know, help them through a difficult time, um, things going on in life. As every single one of us know, in four years of life, there's going to be stuff that happens. And just being a an ear to be able to listen and somebody who knows and ex- experienced college golf say, man, I, I get what you're going through. Uh, maybe, you know, your coach didn't pick you or – uh, your girlfriend broke up with you or, you know, you're struggling in school, family, whatever it is, um, being able to be there as, as someone to listen, to talk to. But then also another aspect of our ministry is that we'll go to uh, college golf tournaments and a lot of times we'll put on Bible studies uh, just for a lot of the teams that we don't get to see on a regular basis um, to, to meet with them, to talk with them, uh, and to be able to care, care for them um, on a kind of a – uh, not as regular basis of some of the teams that we get to see. And I remember in college having guys like Brad and Bun, even when I'd go East Coast, and, and I didn't know Bun as well, but where I, we'd be in tournaments in Florida or Alabama or South Carolina or wherever, um, where there would be a staff guy there and said, hey, we've got a Bible study tonight, come. And to see, it was just really cool, guys from different teams that you know that you're going to go compete with the next day there and you're saying, hey, I, I, I want to know more about this, whether guys are have been Christians uh, and, they, and they're and they wanting to study and grow in their relationship with God or just simply having questions. It's like, man, I've maybe heard about this. I don't really know, uh, but I know this guy for some reason cares about me and uh, is somebody I can go to to ask questions freely. Uh, and it's not that's not going to be frowned upon to say, man, is this really true? Is Jesus who he says he is? Uh, can I trust the Bible that's been written 2,000 to 3,500 years ago, um, and, and why? And, and it's really cool, uh, just the rapport that we have amongst our staff that I can say, hey, my TCU guys are going to be out at a tournament in Florida or California. Uh, say hi to them and, and get them and tell them about the Bible study coming up, and they'll come, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and occasionally you'll go out to dinner with certain teams. Um, you might pick a team and go out to dinner with them, which I think is great. But what what I really love about it is is the ministry that and what drew me to the ministry originally was it it does a great job of building relationships. So you build a relationship because you do have something in common with those kids who are Christians on these teams. Mm-hmm. But there's not a lot in common with a kid who doesn't ha- isn't a Christian. So you find out what interests him and you build a relationship with him. Talk about that because that's that's a unique thing. And and as we recall in the Bible. Christ didn't just walk with people that were believers. Christ walked with non-believe people that just didn't believe in at all in anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, basically all of our staff guys play college golf, and which is which is really cool because there's just a sense of rapport that's already naturally built. And saying, "Hey, man, I get that. I played here these years. Man, do you know this person? Um, you know, I played. You know, like we were talking about regionals at some point, and um, just that natural." just conversation and being able to have with guys. I mean, I, I, I get it. Here's some of my experiences, uh, which is, which is great. And, um, I mean, something that Brad Payne did so well with me is that he just consistently showed up. Uh, and there's a sense of, man, I, I know this guy cares about me. Um, I know that, you know, there's some things that I can't talk to my coach about, uh, cause I'm scared that he won't pick me if, if I, if I'm struggling or whatever, uh, pending on who your coach is. Right. But, um, to have that other person that's not necessarily a part of the coaching staff is something that I can just go and talk to, um, and, and letting guys know that, Hey, I'm, I'm here for you, uh, regardless and, and and I get a lot of what you're going through, which is really really cool. Yeah, and and especially once a a, a coach has invited you to be a part of it, which is great. So ac- actually, at Baylor, you are a team chaplain here, mm-hmm. which I think is great. So our guys get to know you that when we're at tournaments and you see us, um, you know, you might. I mean, you're ministering to everybody, mm-hmm. but you know, we know that we get to see you on a Monday or Tuesday or whenever you come down, which is great. And and but there's 24 other guys doing this on staff. All around the country, and mm-hmm. at one time when it was just Brad and, and Stephen, they didn't get to they didn't get to very many people. They got to as many as they could. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a funny story on um, of the 2002 national championship at the Scarlet Course at Ohio State. And for some reason, the format at the time had no cut, so mm-hmm. you had 30 teams, no cut, and the leading teams teed off in the morning, the final round. So I'm walking 
with a player. And and so Brad and Steven are at that tournament. Mm-hmm. There's just two of them. And I think I think uh, Burdick, Steven Burdick, was a part of it, but he wasn't at that national championship. But Brad and, and uh, Brad left and went. I mean, he left when the morning group finished, and here's Oklahoma State limping around the last nine holes. And I'm looking over here, and they're handing the trophy to Minnesota over here. They're doing the awards <laughs> ceremony. The they're tearing down the the starting tents and the scoring. The, the, every, they're tearing everything down. They're taking everything in from the tournament. We're finished basically, but we've got nine more holes to play. And I'll be doggone. And that old Stephen Bunn, he walked with me that whole back nine and just put his arm around me because he knew I was miserable. And I always gave Brad a hard time because he was like a figurehead. And here Stephen was working so hard. <laughs> He's like, "Well, it's over. I'm going to leave." Uh, then the very next year, the two of them actually stayed in my house when we hosted nationals at Karsten Creek. Wow. So they stayed in my house the next year, which was great. But Speaking of history in TCU, yes. the Scarlet Course, there was a uh, TCU player that finished pretty high that week, I'm pretty sure. In 2002? Uh, let's see, who would it have been? Uh, J.J. Henry, I don't know. Oh. That's He's earlier. Who? Walker Cupper. Oh, Adam Rubinson. Adam Rubinson. Absolutely. Absolutely. What was I thinking? Of course. Come on. Come I'm on. sorry. I, I'm a golf historian. I should know that. But, yeah. you know, uh, so anyway, uh, the relationships build and they build and they build over years, which is great. And, I, you know, I'm continuing that. You and I have a relationship still to this day. Mm-hmm. It started at golf camp at Oklahoma State. It's continued through CGF. But we actually just got through with a college golf fellowship function just yesterday uh, talk about that because my wife got to benefit from that, in fact. Yeah, so, you know, we have um, our discipleship and Bible studies that we do with teams weekly. And the, I'll see five different teams that I'll go on campus and get to be with them. We'll go to tournaments. But then one of the kind of uh, headliners, I guess, if you want to call it that, of College Golf Fellowship is our retreats. And, um, and so normally what our retreats look like, so – I don't know, roughly around, I guess it might have been right when you started mm-hmm. coaching. Paul mm-hmm. Stankowski he did. Uh, played on the PGA Tour for a long time, won a few times out there. Um, he, Him and Brad Payne were good friends growing up, and he said, man, let's just do a retreat and do it at my house, uh, which was pretty cool. And so for the last 20-plus years, PGA Tour players have been hosting at their homes these college golf fellowship retreats. And they say, hey, bring as many guys as you can, and you, we can come pile them in our, in our house. We would have a local pastor or some of our uh, CGF staff teach that week, and we'd have three or four uh, teaching sessions. We'd stay at guys like uh, Paul Stankowski, Davis Love, Justin Leonard, uh, Zach Johnson, Webb Simpson, um, Lee Jansen, Lee Jansen. Uh, Cameron Tringali, uh, Russell Henley, Scotty Scheffler, Sam Burns, uh, just to name a few of those guys that have hosted retreats for us in the past. And an amazing uh, few days that are free for any current men's college golfer to come to, um, whether you uh, know who Jesus is or simply know Jesus as a cuss word, but you just want to come and hang out with a PGA Tour player for a few days. And that was really where uh, God kind of changed my life uh, in college. He said, I played golf at TCU, and, and kind of my first two years um, was just doing the whole college thing, as m- many of you listening know, of just like, hey, I just want to go party and have fun and try to play good golf and, and, and all of this stuff. But it was kind of through this relationship with Brad Payne and him inviting me to come to Paul Stankowski's house in August of 2008 um, where I was just tired of uh, the race of trying to find satisfaction and joy from uh, chasing after uh, stuff in college. And I'd heard the gospel hundreds of times and who Jesus is, but it was finally at that retreat where um, God just opened my eyes to who he is. It, I remember a pastor was talking about Psalm 32 in uh, David's hidden sin and how it was just a weight on him is crushing him. And that's how my life was. I would have said I was a Christian and followed Jesus, but nothing about my life reflected that. 
And uh, I remember talking to Brad. I was like, man, hey, Brad, I'm I'm in. I just want to follow mm-hmm. Jesus and accepted Christ. Uh, got baptized at Paul Stankowski's house. Were in, you there? I was there. You were in the pool. It yeah. was in their pool. At yeah, the that, was, that was so cool and, and a moment that I would never forget. And so that was 13 plus years ago. Um, and at this college got for fellowship retreat where there were probably 50 plus guys there. Um, and just all coming to, you know, learn more about who God is, have fun, uh, hear the Bible taught. And, and really from those retreats, you just got some of the best friends in my entire life. You know, the, I've really been to cool. a bunch of those retreats as well, sleeping in a sleeping bag, you know, but there's great Bible teaching. There's great food, mm-hmm. there's great fun, there's golf, there's games, there's always something going on that make it fun and interesting, but the central part of it is the teaching that goes on. Yeah. And I, I think another thing that really has always impressed me was to be in a tour player's home and watch it, his wife and kids interact with him, and then he's giving his testimony. And, and college golfers, Christian and non-Christian, can see what authentic Christian walk looks like from an athlete, a world-class yeah. athlete who's playing on, on the weekends. You know, it, in fact, we're getting ready to have a conference in December with Sam Burns and Scotty Scheffler, mm-hmm. and they both finished top 10 this week on the PGA Tour. So the guys all are very, very well-versed in who these people are, but now they get to see them in a completely different light, and it's really special. Yeah, which is so fun. I mean, hear, hearing um, these tour guys tell tell stories about the tour, just experience they had, whether it's Ryder Cup or winning majors, and um, it is it's so fun. Obviously, for every single one of us to sit and listen to that. But then when they talk about their Lord, their King Jesus, um, man, it's just it's even more amazing because these guys that we kind of put up on a pedestal. Uh, it's like, oh man, like they're almost untouchable. Um, that they're saying, "Hey, I am needy. I am spiritually desperate, and I am in need of a savior because of my sin." And and Jesus is that savior, the Messiah that um, that God had promised uh, all the way back thirty five hundred plus years ago, uh, when looking at the Old Testament and said, "Man, Jesus came onto the scene." Um, and he lived the perfect life that uh, none of us could live, even these tour players talking about, man, I, I can never live up to um, the perfect standard of a holy God. And and for them to humbly say that and say, man, I, I gave my life to Jesus. I submitted my life to Christ, and he is my ultimate authority. It's not my game. It's not my how much money I make or any of this stuff that I chase after. I want to know God more, and he's provided that through Jesus. And so for them to be able to share that with college guys, uh, it, it truly is amazing. Um, they say, hey, I'm just another guy, just like every single one of y'all. Sure, I may have more trophies or whatever else, uh, but we're all in the same boat. Uh, that we do, we are created to have a relationship with God, and He's provided that through Christ. Well, you know, all these kids know who Webb Simpson is, and mm-hmm. Webb, you know, I competed with at Oklahoma State when I was a coach there. You know, I walked a lot of fairways with Webb, I, you know, and I knew he was a really special guy. But to see him in the other element, which is in a faith base, his podcast interview with me about a year ago—I mean, somewhere around a year ago—was. Mm-hmm very special because he wasn't afraid to share his faith and he wasn't afraid to talk about how important that is and that he is a broken man and that he needs that. His need for a savior is way, way more important than any sort of golf trophy. And he's a U.S. Open champion. He's Mm -hmm. won a a dozen times on the PGA Tour. He's an amazing player, but he's also just a man. Mm -hmm. And his humility is is really striking. Yeah. And I, I mean, I remember when uh, the USGA changed the whole anchoring, putting, ban thing, and all that stuff. And man, he was like that was detrimental to him. He could have ended his career right there. Yeah, uh, but to see, it's like okay, hey, where can we go uh, from here? And, and the way that he approached that was pretty incredible. In his transparency and saying, "Man, I was scared." Mm-hmm. Uh, really cool how he shared that uh, several in several different instances with guys, uh, which is cool. But I mean, so. Those college golf fellowship retreats, obviously, it's it's not simply just uh, us sitting in, around the Bible and, and teaching. It is that, and that's obviously the main focus. But, man, this is some of the most fun that I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, I mean, we'll play a bunch of different sports. 
uh, it's, it is awesome. And just hearing stories, uh, one of the stories we were talking about earlier in talking about this podcast coach was uh, Tony Romo hosted a retreat once at, or a couple of times in his house in Dallas. And, um, one of the coolest things that he walked us through game film and, um, and it was the Cowboys playing the Giants. I can't remember what year it was, but it was one of the last regular season games. And and they had they were behind in the fourth quarter, and they had to drive to be able to get into the playoffs and and clinch the NFC East. And he just walked us through every single aspect of that. And I remember we were all sitting in his living room. There were probably fifty or sixty of us. And he was like, "Yes, you know, Tiger came. He he would always come and stay at the house and come to the games. And we were watching uh, something one day, and he was sitting there." And I remember one of the college guys, Ryan Johnson, he played at McLennan and then Augusta State, and, and he was just a huge Tiger fan. And he said, wait, hold on, Tony. So so <laughs> Tiger was was here. He said, yeah. He says, and, and he was sitting right here where I'm sitting. And he said, yeah, he was sitting right there. And he's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he probably didn't even remember anything of what Tony was talking about. Uh, but all he could think about was simply that he was sitting in the same place that Tiger Woods was. Uh, and he was, like, drooling. It was, it was pretty embarrassing for him. But but, but that's uh, another special. <laughs> Tony Romo hosting a, a, a CGF conference at his house. And obviously everybody knows of Tony's love for the game of golf, which is great. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just for him to do that is pretty special as yeah, well. Yeah, it really is. But um, they, they truly are. Uh, some of the most fun uh, times and experiences that I've had in my life. I've had some of the best, met some of the best friends in my life. Uh, a guy named Dragon Majors is on our staff in Dallas, and I remember us meeting at a college golf fellowship retreat and and playing ping pong till probably two in the morning uh, with him and his brother that played at Oklahoma State. And um, by the way, that was at, at uh, Ben Crane's, I believe. That was, and none of you guys ever beat Ben Crane at at ping pong ever. The guy was amazing, incredible, yeah. which. I think the the one person though that would beat him would be Scotty Scheffler. He is an animal. Really, anything. Really, I mean, it's ping pong. We he played pickleball. I think for the first time last year at the retreat he hosted and just waxed everybody. <laughs> and and especially on the basketball court, he is a he's a freak athletically. And, pretty good uh, golfer, is that? I, you know, yeah. he is pretty good. But I would say he's almost better at some of those other things. But you know, that's up for debate still. Well, but those are the retreats you're talking about that are for the players, and obviously. The those are great. And some coaches go. I've gone to a dozen of them through the years. They've been great. But the, the retreat you and I and our wives went to this weekend in Dallas and Fort Worth was pretty special as well. Yeah, it was. So sorry I got off on a little bit no, of a tangent No, that's great. There. I'm glad but, you did. Um, so one of the cool things we did on, on the East Coast starting off, and I think when, when was the first one you went to? 2001 and 2002 out in North Carolina. Okay, yeah. So our staff guys out on the East Coast want to say, hey, we want to not only have – uh, and minister towards these men's college golfers, but their coaches as, w- as well. And they started a uh, college golf fellowship coaches and wives retreat. And we just had our central one uh, this past weekend in Fort Worth, which was incredible. We had 12 men's college golf coaches, uh, mainly from the central region, come to Fort Worth, stayed in a hotel. Brad Payne taught uh, four different sessions uh, through the Bible. And I mean, we just had fun. We laughed, and it is we know just as a staff and kind of being around college golf of of how much you coaches work. Like during the season, you're gone a lot. You're traveling. I uh, mean, your families really do sacrifice a ton, and and you don't get to see your wife as much as maybe somebody else with a, another job. And so, um, it was really cool how several years ago, I guess twenty years ago now. Um, that some of our older staff guys are just, man, we want to pour into coaches in their marriages uh, because we know, man, marriage is hard. Um, and for for us to be able to truly uh, care for our spouse or really anybody in our life, we have to have a solid foundation in our relationship with God. Uh, we're never going to be able to truly love people unless we're first, unless we first know that we are loved. And so, our relationship with God vertically dictates every single relationship in our life uh, that would be declared uh, horizontal, per se. And, and so, just the reminder of that, even my, just my wife and I getting to have a couple days where we can slow down, where we can breathe, where we can talk about things, um, you know, that are that are just really important uh, to be reminded of who our God is and how much he loves us and how we're called to just care for each other 
well. And uh, I know y'all have been to the few that we've done here in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, and and um, it is it is so fun uh, to take those few days to be able to do that. Really good, and I really Pam Pam and I really appreciate that. But it actually got me on the golf course. We went to Shady Oaks and I played the par three course. hadn't been on the course in a long time. Man, and it was a stripe show. Well, uh, it, yeah. you know, it, it you lined up and yes. you hit it exactly. Uh, right in the middle of the club face, yes, the shape of the shot was mm-hmm. exactly what you were looking for. Mm-hmm. It was going in the exact direction. I think you had it was about one eighty or so, and it was a five iron. It was a five, it iron. Was a five iron. Oh man, he posed on it. Mm-hmm. Um, as some of you that know, coach, I mean, he's built in the same stature, I guess, as is Mister Hogan, and and being out there and all of the just ridiculous knowledge that he has about. Uh, Mr. Hogan was kind of coming out in his golf swing, and it was incredible. The only thing was it was about 20 yards short. Yeah, the distance has gone, but that's okay. At least you got me on the golf course. I hadn't hadn't been on a course playing in quite a while. (laughs) Well, you you know how far your five iron goes now. It's about 160. No, a little further than that. I think it's (laughs) 165 maybe. It was a little bit into the wind, but we won't won't go into details. Either way, I I was on a golf course, and I appreciated that. But I did enjoy the retreat. (laughs) So let's let's talk about if any of the listeners out there are college golfers or future college golfers, how do they get involved with College Golf Fellowship? How do they get connected? Yeah, so um, probably the easiest thing to do is to go to our website at College Golf Fellowship. Maybe you're in high school right now and, and you haven't met any of our staff guys and you're committed to go somewhere. Um, but on our website, you can see all of our staff guys across the country and their info and be able to reach out. Um, and so if that is something you're interested in, or maybe you're on a college golf team now and you haven't maybe heard of college golf fellowship yet, you, you go onto our website and, and you're just like, man, there's not really a staff guy anywhere near, uh, still reach out to us. Um, one of the, the coolest things about our college golf fellowship retreats is that we have guys fly in from all over. Um, and, and we have East Coast, West Coast, Central retreats in the, uh, in the winter and summer months that are, are free for men's college golfers Th- to go to. That's the other point. They don't cost a dime. All you do is get yourself there. And if you can get to the retreat, everything's taken care of. All the golf, all the food, all the teach, it's all taken care of. Absolutely. And we promise that you will leave uh, full. Uh, you're going to eat plenty. It might not be the best food for you, uh, <laughs> but you will eat plenty, play plenty. It, it'll be awesome. And um, I mean, some of the really the three main promises we make in a college golf fellowship retreats are that, I mean, you're going to have a lot of fun. You are going to hear the Bible taught in probably a way that you maybe never have before. Uh, by someone who is uh, well-trained biblically, who knows God's Word uh, and is able to communicate it. Uh, and then, man, you're going to get to see, as Coach talked about, just really what the Christian life looks like, Christian fellowship, Christian friendship, Christian marriage, if you're in, uh, if, if we're in one of the homes of the PGA Tour players. Uh, and it was something that had a profound impact on me. And, I mean, kind of speaking of that, as far as just relationships, Uh, It helped guide me in what I wanted to find in a woman. Uh, I've been married for now almost 10 years, which is crazy. My wife and I started dating in college. And um, being able to see, man, what do I want in a wife? And having someone like Brad uh, walk with me through that. um, And then him kind of dreadfully telling me, hey, are you that man that that woman wants to marry? Which was, Mm -hmm. I even tell that to guys now, they're like, uh, <laughs> which is which is something we really never think about. We think about what we want, but am I what uh, what she wants? Yeah, you think is she the perfect girl for me? Well, that you got to be the perfect guy for her, the perfect man for her, the perfect godly man for her. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so, being able to take that seriously and know it's like, man, if this woman loves God and and she she's going to want a godly man to be able to walk. Um, her life with and, and just being around you coach it's it's been fun to see the your interaction with Pam uh, the way that uh, y'all's marriage is and the way that you care for her and the way that um, that you love each other uh, it, it truly is fun to see and encouraging to my wife Katie and I uh, in so many ways 
Yeah, because we're not exactly in the same uh, chapter of life as you exactly. all are. You know, we're a little further down the highway. It's time. always good to look at somebody a little bit further down the road yeah, uh, exactly. than you. Well, listen, I, I just want to say thanks, uh, Travis, for you know taking a little bit of time, about 45 or 50 minutes, just to talk to us about College Girls Fellowship, something that's very special to me, and also making kids and college players and coaches and high school players even mm-hmm. more aware that this – is an opportunity for them. It's a great opportunity for them and a lot of fun and a great learning experience. So thanks for coming on today. Uh Thank you, Coach.